Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to our course, BC310. And uh, let us pray, and we will start. I think okay, Nico? All right, let's pray. Let's start. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to get together and learn. And we ask for the ministry, for the anointing of your spirit to help us. And the things we hear, may they be useful to us as each of us serve you in the ways you've called us to serve. And may we put this to good use for your kingdom, for your glory, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we have been learning about church and ministry management. Today we go into our lesson number eight, which is volunteer management. We spoke about staff management. Now we start out a new lesson on volunteer management. I'm sorry I uh, missed our classes last week. So we have um, to catch up on some things. I think we can. And uh, everything okay? All right. So let's read a few scriptures as we start talking about volunteer management and the importance of having volunteers serve in church or even in Christian organization. So even if you are not necessarily running a church, but you may have some sort of a Christian organization, NGO, something. Even there, you can have volunteers come. In fact, a lot of NGOs are uh, volunteer-driven. You know, they have lots and lots, sometimes thousands of volunteers uh, are serving. And uh, so volunteers become a very important part of uh, the work. And we need to think through on uh, how to engage volunteers, how to have volunteers be a part of the work and so on. So we'll talk about that and some challenges and how do we work through those challenges. Let's um, read uh, Romans chapter 12, verses 4 through 8. So we understand a, uh, for a Christian ministry, the biblical context uh, of, um, of all of this. So Romans 12, verses 4 to 8, Paul writes here, he says, for as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith or ministry. Let us use it in our ministering, he who teaches and teaching. He who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. So what Paul is telling us here, and then you know there are other passages, Ephesians 4 and 7 and 1 Peter 4, 10 through 11, uh, 1 Corinthians 12 also we can see, verse 28, is that you know uh, every believer, who's, every believer is a part of the body of Christ, and Every believer as a member has some function in the body. Right? So it's very important, first of all, uh, as a leader, in, in, in our mindset, as leaders, in our mindset, we must think like this, that every person in the congregation has a function in the body. Right? So by default, uh, pastors or leaders will say, I will do all the work, you just come and sit. You only come and listen to me. You give attendance on Sunday morning. <laughs> that is your role. But I will do everything. No, no. But that's the wrong way of thinking. The Bible way of thinking is every member, every person who's every believer has a function in the body. And uh, they were six. We have gifts differing according to the grace given to us. That means um, every believer has 
gifts that God, Jesus has given them, according to the grace he has given them. So, I am not the one deciding the gifts. I am not the one deciding the grace. That is decided by Jesus. So there are three things here. There is function, there is gifts, and there is grace. Right? That means the Lord Jesus has given every believer function, gifts, grace. In the church, every believer. And the call is here, let us use them. The call is, let us use it. That means whatever function, whatever gifts, whatever grace given to you, use it. That is where, as leaders, our responsibility comes, which is, let us create an environment where everybody will be able to step into their function, use their gifts, and move in the grace that God has given them. So that is where, as leaders, we have to create a safe and healthy environment. But we must recognize, first of all, every person sitting in the congregation, every believer, has function, gifts, and grace. Right? So, from so what we must, uh, and also we, we need to create that understanding. See, by default, most people don't think like that. Most people will think, oh, uh, I just come, I will sit in church, and I'll go. And uh, there are few people who will do all the spiritual ministry, I'll just come and go. Most people think like that. But we have to change their thinking and we have to change our thinking also. Right? We have to make it biblical. Biblical is, uh, every believer has function, gifts and grace. And as leaders, or as a local church, or as a ministry, you have to create that environment where people can safely exercise, fulfill their function, gifts, and grace. And also keep in mind that some of this function may be inside the local church, some of it may be outside. Right? Uh, it's not like it, everything has to happen only inside. Like, for example, uh, he mentions some gifts here. It's not there's not a complete list, but he mentions you know like prophesying, uh, ministering, which is service, teaching, encouraging, giving, leading, showing mercy. Some of this can happen inside the local church. Some of it can happen outside the local church. It's okay, right? But believers are fulfilling their function, right? And uh, we have to create an environment for this, right? where everyone can. So uh, this is where volunteers come in. That means people from the congregation. When we say volunteers, we're saying people from the congregation who want to serve God, who want to fulfill their function, uh, exercise their gifts, and move in the grace that God has put on their lives. These are volunteers. So how do we? You know, how do we manage this? How do we lead this? You have to lead it carefully. Because it's not going to happen uh, by itself. We have to encourage them. We have to guide them. We have to have some do's and don'ts. You know, uh, uh, it's like if you see the body, how the body functions. The heart one day is not beating, next day it is trying to see, next day it's trying to hear. No. Well, you function as a heart, man. that's your function, function there. But there's a place. You, it's got to be here. You, know? you, you, you cannot move anywhere. The heart cannot go to the leg and say, today I want to beat from the leg. No. <laughs> God has given you a place, you be there. Right? So there is a set place. There is a proper way uh, for all this to happen. Yeah, it is true. Every believer has a function and a gift and grace, but there is also order. Right? There is a way this is brought together. Right? And, and the human body is an example, and Paul points to the human body, you know, how the body functions. That's in 1 Corinthians 12. Right? So we have to learn some lessons and try to see how we can encourage everybody to function and guide them how to do it properly. So um, volunteers, volunteers are very important. 
for the local church or for any Christian ministry. Right? So the qu some questions, you know, how do we invite and engage volunteers? So first of all, we have to say, you know, we are welcome. Uh, volunteers come, so how do we invite them? How do we engage them? Then also is to what extent can we engage volunteers? Because some things in the church uh, would require full-time people. You know, uh, you can't have volunteers. And, you know, we have tried over time and sometimes we realize, oh, this cannot be done by volunteers. We have to change. Like that, we have tried many things. And then we realize, okay, for this, you need some full-time people. You cannot have volunteers. Because volunteers can only give a little bit of time. Uh, so much, but the role may require full time, you know, and so that's when we have to know what can volunteers do, what requires full time people, you know, and then how can the ministry function in, in such a way that there are full time people, staff, as well as they are volunteers? How do we all work together? Right? How do we all work together? How can we arrange, uh, how do we structure the organization or the ministry so that we all work together? And, and then, of course, there will be some problems, you know, uh, volunteers. Uh, we, we talked about staff, so I'm not saying there are no problems with staff. There are problems that side, but now we're talking volunteers. So even from volunteer side, there could be some problems. How do we handle those problems and uh, so on, right? But so that's what we want to learn in this lesson. But let's talk about the benefits. You know, what are the benefits of engaging volunteers? You know, there are many benefits. First of all, the congregation or people who are you know, part of the church or ministry, uh, they feel they belong to this. You know, so when, you, when people start serving, they feel like it's my church. Like, you know, it's my thing. I'm not just coming and going. It's I am doing something to make this uh, church happen. I am part of the life of this church. You know, so they immediately get a sense of belonging. They feel like I'm part of it now, you know, which is very good. Um, it also gives them opportunity to exercise and nurture spiritual gifts. That means uh, in order gifts they have, they can start exercising it. And if they do it faithfully and over time, they can grow in that. They can, you know. So many of our full time staff today actually started as volunteers. Like example, Pastor Nancy, a long time ago, I don't know which year it was, but long time ago, uh, she started a life group. So she was attending church. Then I think her first thing was to lead a life group. So long time ago. Right? So she didn't start off as pastor. You know, she started, she started the life group. So leading a life group. Then you see that faithfulness. You see, oh yeah, she has some you know, gifting to teach, right? And uh, yeah, in between, she went abroad to uh, do her masters. Then she came back, and she continued leading life group. So you see the faithful, and then you see how they're being accountable. You know, uh, then you give them a little bit opportunity. Then, okay, can you lead this? Um, uh, campus elevates, like you know, uh, the what we do in colleges, campus. So she started that. Oh, yeah, she was doing that. She was good. Okay. Then from there, okay, we invited her to be a volunteer pastor. So she didn't join us as a full time pastor. She became a volunteer pastor for not. That means she was working and pastoring. So we saw that. Then after that, we said, okay, would you like to join us full time? So she started as a, first she started only by leading a life group. Then slowly we gave up responsibility. Okay. So like that, you know, so many people, they were volunteers first, serving some, and then they, you know, uh, we asked them to join us staff as we saw them, how they were serving and so on. So uh, they exercise their gifts and their gifts develop. And you recognize, oh, this person has these gifts. This person has these gifts. This person has these. You're able to see it. So that's what Paul is saying. You know, everybody has some gifts. 
everybody has some grace but when you give them the opportunity then you see the gift in operation yeah you see the result then you can then so thirdly the local church itself functions as a body a lot of people are doing one it's not that the eye is trying to do everything i is trying to hear and smell and taste and no everybody are doing so then you have a whole body um, number four, it is um, it gives people an opportunity to turn their learning into action. So you come, you're listening to the sermon, you're hearing the messages, but how do you apply that? You know, so here by volunteering, you're able to apply what you're learning into practical things. Uh, then you also have a larger workforce. That means you have more people to serve, which means you can do a lot more. And uh, of course, with volunteers, there are no financial expense, right? That means they're doing it freely. They're doing it voluntarily. Uh, they're giving their time and their effort and so on. So there are there's a lot of benefits in having volunteers serve, right? So constantly be having. But there are also limitations. Right? What are the limitations? They're only available for small periods of time because they have their own responsibilities. They have many of them have the job, they have responsibilities. So they will say, I can give so many hours in a week or whatever time. So it's only time, certain. Time. And then uh, volunteers will have, will have higher priorities. I mean, especially if they are working, and uh, if the if the workplace says you have to travel, they have to go. They can't say I'm volunteering in church. I can't travel. No, <laughs> they, so, they have to go. So sometimes, uh, you know, based on their work and all that, they may not be available um, to help in certain things. Um, Sometimes volunteers need to transfer trans, transition from corporate culture to church culture. So this this is again something we'll talk about culture, but uh, there is a good and the bad. The corporate culture, in some ways, it's good, meaning uh, they are organized. They like to they do things in a very organized way. Uh, they like to be on time. Uh, they like to do it well. You know, so that those are good things of corporate culture, which uh, we should take into what we are doing. But at the same time, in the corporate culture, people are trying to be better than others. There's a lot of competition because I want promotion. Uh, I, I, what is that person always oh, doing like that? I'll do better. So in in the corporate world, it's like that where you want to, you know, always be the person in charge. You want to be noticed. Uh, you, you know, you want to book okay, only then because your salary will depend on this, your promotion will depend on this. So you do that. So those things don't sit well in the church culture. Church culture, we appreciate people who will do without making any noise. You want to serve, serve quietly. Don't make noise. You know? uh, don't be worried about who notices you, who whether anybody gives you, you know, thing. Just serve quietly. We'll be looking for those kinds of people. But sometimes what happens, they get it mixed up. You know, then they come to church, they want to know, they want to be in charge, they want to, you know, be the lead, uh, they want to, uh, they want recognition. Uh, then, then those things we have to say, hey, no, 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 keep that there in your corporate. Uh, church culture, it's different, right? Jesus told us, if you want to be the leader, you have to be a servant, right? Uh, if you want to be the leader, you don't come as a boss, you come as a servant. Of course, there are good things, like we said do it with excellence, do it very organized. All those, those are good things. Those things you bring. But other things, you know, leave out. So uh, that transition has to happen. Uh, in some cases, volunteers may overcommit and underdeliver. That means they are so enthusiastic. They say, yeah, I'll do this, I'll do this, I'll do this. Then after some time, say, what happened? Oh, I didn't have time. I was too busy. I had to go. So that also, you know, so we have to take everything with, like, okay. It's better that we recognize how much they can do slowly, give them, uh, you know, commitments and all that. So these things that we've learned. So uh, let's talk about these teams and so on. So uh, certain ministry areas uh, will require dedicated full-time staff, cannot be volunteer-driven. Right? So there are many things. For example, accounting. We require a full-time accountant. There's so much of work that cannot be done by volunteers. The only thing volunteers, as far as accounting is 
concerned volunteers do is they count the money on Sunday offering. So offering offertory counting is done by volunteers. Okay, that is fine. You can do it because you only need half an hour after service to stay and count, or, you know, and write it down, send it. That can be done. But during the week, there is so much of accounting work. So you need a full-time person. Many years ago, uh, many years ago, means I'm going back to the very beginning, like 2001 till maybe 2002 and three. we had volunteers doing graphic design. In fact, the church logo that we are still using was designed by a volunteer in the beginning. We're still using that same logo. That was in, uh, you know, uh, before 2003. There was one of volunteers, young man, he was into graphic design. I said, can you design a logo? We want this, this, this. We want to have the cross. We want to have the Bible. We want to have the dove. Uh, we want to have the globe. So he, he came up with this logo. Very nice. We're still using it. Okay? But what happened was uh, after some time, the amount of graphic work, this was in 2003 or something, uh, that we needed was a little bit more. It means a volunteer cannot do it. So then we hired a consultant. That means uh, a paid person. It was not a full-time staff. Um, we'll give you work, you do. In fact, uh, Karuna Jerome, she was the first person we hired. This was uh, now she has her own business, but she was our first graphic design consultant. So any work we want, we'll send it to her. She'll do it, send it back. Then after some time, we realized that was not enough. That means we needed full-time people as church staff. I forget which year this was. Um, uh, many Again, many years ago. So then we moved. We said, Karuna, thank you very much for your work. But uh, we need a full-time person now. The amount of work is so much. So from now onwards, we will not be giving you our graphic design work. We will be having one person sitting in the church office doing the work full time. So we moved like that. So we started with volunteers, consultant part time, then full time. Right. So now we have like two graphic designers. We have media team, all that. It depends on the volume of work. You know. So in those early days, we were doing TV programs, but we did not have any TV stuff. Everything was outside. We'll just go, uh, people will record. Too. So 2001, from 2001, we started TV programs. Um, but we never had a full-time media. We never had a media team. People outside just doing it. And then later on, we hired. So slowly as the church or the ministry grows, these, you know, well, you start with volunteers, then when the work grows, you may need to transition that bit of work into full-time staff right so we identify ministry areas where volunteers can be engaged so what we do is this right when we see a ministry we say look can we engage volunteers here so live groups for example is a nice area where volunteers can serve because they have a live group maybe once a month once a week sorry uh, they will meet for about one to two hours. So the life group leader may have to spend a little extra time to prepare uh, and lead the life group. So it's not too much of time commitment. Right? So their life group leaders are, are all volunteers. But then to somebody to oversee the life group leaders, initially we did not have. Later on, we had a full-time life group coordinator. So now... Uh, Pastor Paul Emanuel, he's our life group coordinator. That means she's just checking over all the life groups, making sure they're all going fine, connecting people to life groups, answering their questions, training new life group leaders, starting new life groups, or if some people leave and then their life group has to close, then they have to help people move to another life group, all those things. Somebody's full there full time to take care of that work. Right? Um, so when you're engaging volunteers, you also need to establish uh, reasonable expectations. That means, what can they do, what they cannot do? Right? 
what do you, what are you expecting them from them you know how much time you're committing asking from them uh, uh, what is the level at which they should work you know sometimes and we've changed this but sometimes people think oh i'm a volunteer so i can do what i want so no you're a volunteer but if you want to volunteer at apc we expect certain things i mean we cannot tolerate you know we say it's a privilege that you're a volunteer that you have the opportunity to volunteer you're not you're not doing god a favor and you're not doing apc a favor you know it's a privilege that i'm giving you the opportunity to volunteer you know so that's the attitude we we try to create that hey to be a volunteer at apc is a privilege that you've been given it's not an entitlement it's not you're not doing us a favor you're not doing god a favor so we have to change that mindset because otherwise volunteers have the mindset generally i'm saying you know and this was in in the beginning many years ago they have the mindset that hey, i'm doing god a favor i'm giving my time freely i'm doing work freely nobody's paying so i can come when i want i can do whatever no 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 that is not if you're a volunteer we expect same commitment or even more commitment as a staff so commitment must be there excellence must be there otherwise you cannot be a volunteer and we have some guidelines some expectations so we have to change the mindset of volunteers right volunteer mean doesn't mean you can do anything you want right doesn't mean you can just you know uh, function at, as way there is if you want to volunteer at church we have some guidelines we um, have some expectations and it's a privilege we're giving you to be a volunteer otherwise don't take it up so that mindset has to change uh, and uh, we have to create that uh, expectation so uh, if you look at what's happening at apc uh, there are lots of uh, different teams so the way we work is we create volunteer teams i mean groups of people the reason we have groups of people is because many of these require more than one person and also we roster people so that the workload doesn't come on the same set of people all the time okay right? so we can distribute the load which gives more people opportunity to participate so there are teams that serve during the sunday services right? um and some of these things you you, you know many of you may already know uh, greeters parking lot uh, security information desk registration welcome lounge connect ushers and so on right so all these are many of them are volunteers and uh, then there are also ministry teams which means people who are engaged in doing ministry like worship team right so maybe i don't know what the number is but generally it's around 60 70 people who are part of the worship team uh, we do have you know worship pastors but the rest are all uh, worship Uh, sorry our volunteers uh, life groups youth ministry and so many other ministries where volunteers are serving okay? and um, uh, so these are different teams right so sunday services people are usually rostered like you know so the the, the load is distributed across many people sunday to sunday and in many of these teams and we've seen this uh, hub and spoke model before in many of these teams we have a mix of uh, pastors and church staff so these teams that this round uh, uh, yellow groups that you see are uh, people serving in that ministry area and it's a combination of pastors church staff and volunteers who form those teams there in many of these areas right in some cases it will be fully volunteer team in some cases it will be a mix of uh, pastors staff and things so many teams we can form many teams and uh, these things can happen ministry can happen right so let's get into the details now so uh, how do we get volunteers and um, get them engaged so we cannot tell people 
Oh, you want to volunteer? Just go and volunteer. No, because we need to let them understand our guidelines. Uh, in many cases, we need to give them some training, uh, uh, some orientation, and uh, then we can, you know, then everybody can function properly, right? So we we don't just say, oh, just go do what you want. No, there is a there's a proper way by which we get people involved. So when people come to church, we um, we need to first of all let them know that they are welcome to volunteer. Because sometimes people may be afraid. Uh, they may not know that there are such opportunities. Uh, they may not know that uh, we welcome uh, them in their using their skills and so on. So what happens? So every Sunday in our Sunday video announcement, there's one slide that says volunteer. And that's done intentionally. Every Sunday we're telling people, you know, hey, you can serve, you can volunteer. And we make it very easy. They just have to go to the website, apcw.org slash volunteer, and they can sign up. So anytime anybody wants to do it, all it takes is go to that website, check on the areas you want to sign, give your name, you can reach out, right? Uh, so that's one way uh, we, uh, we try to let people know that, um, uh, uh that they're welcome to sign also um we have uh, uh, um, what we call as a vip banquet that means every quarter uh, all the people have come new to church uh, we let them know we give them all the how to sign up for volunteers in fact you know uh, from the time when we do our follow-up calls phone calls when people come new to church uh, if they decide to keep coming to church, then the people who are making those calls will help connect them to a life group and also say, would you like to volunteer? And we'll tell them about, you know, where they can volunteer. So we, right from beginning, from, say, within the first few weeks of them starting to come to church, we let them know that they can volunteer if they want. But they have to sign up. Okay? Um, then we do this again at the VIP banquet. We let them know you can sign up. So uh, then we have these special volunteer drives or on Sundays, uh, we have people who share the testimonies of having volunteers. So all these ways we try to you know, engage people to volunteer. But uh, when we uh, do this, uh, you know, so when they sign up, uh, we reach out to them and then we make clear what they are, they, they should be doing. So if they say, I want to volunteer in as a greeter, you know, then we have these guidelines written up. Okay, you want to volunteer as a greeter, see, this is what is required of you. You need to come to, you need to be at the service, you know, from at, by this time. Uh, you need to be standing there, you need to be smiling, shaking hands, whatever. That's a simple thing. But if it's book table, then the guidelines are written. You need to come, you know, at least half an hour before the service. You have to put up the table, the books have to be arranged like this, you know, like how, how we normally do, and they have to be packed up like that. Uh, you have to check the inventory every Sunday. If the inventory goes down, you have to inform the church office. So there are all these things that have to be followed. It's not like you can just come in, you know, it's good that somebody signs up, but they need to be, ex the, the guidelines and the procedure, what needs to be done has to be explained. So like that, for every area of ministry, we have guidelines. And so on. In some cases, they need to be trained. Example, media, audio, cameras, PowerPoint. These things, they just can't come and sit and start off. You know, they have to go through a training. So we will go through the training. In some cases, they have to audition, meaning you have to like pass a test, right? Because we need to check, do you really have the skills, right? Uh, especially in worship, worship team. No, you know, there are a lot of people who are, are interested, but we want to maintain a certain standard. So we have an audition, we, you know, they, they're given a song to, you know, to come prepared for. And uh, if they do pass the audition, then they are. Things. So that means nobody can randomly get into the worship team. 
So that happens. You know, the, we are that thing of sharing the guidelines and are you okay with this, right? Because at that time they can say, I'm not okay. Uh, I don't want to follow these guidelines. Then it's okay, fine. Maybe you're not forcing you to be a volunteer. But if you want to be a volunteer, you have to follow these guidelines. Because we want to create a safe environment for everybody. So everybody knows how to work and uh, nobody is going and doing their own thing. Right? So that's why we, we have this. And it happens for all the teams. Um, uh, we communicate the policies, accountability, all that. Right? Now, um, page 31, we like to uh, have a mix of people in our volunteer teams, right? We see that volunteer teams can be a great opportunity for young and old, you know, older people to work together, right? So that way, young people can connect with older people and, you know, feel part of the team. Now, there are some areas where only young people can serve. For example, set up, because there you have to carry heavy things, you have to you know move things. So there usually it'll be mostly young people carrying the speakers and this and that and all those things. Young people are doing it. Uh, but generally other areas where we can have a mix of age groups, we like to do that. So then everyone can work together, they can talk, they can make relationships, uh, they can share and uh, they can learn from each other. So we like to create a mix wherever possible. Uh, it may not be possible in all uh, volunteer teams, but wherever possible, right? So once, uh, you know, uh, they join a volunteer team, then there is, they are introduced to that particular team. Uh, they are get, usually they get added to the WhatsApp group. Usually everything is being coordinated on the WhatsApp groups now. Um, and um, they, uh, they they explain how the team works, what all the people, this is what is ex expected, the culture, the practices, standards. Uh, this is very important. Now, he, sometimes, you know, we don't see problems in the beginning, but later on, after the person has joined the team, problems start happening. You know, I'll, I'll give some examples. Um, later on, but then that's when you know the the team is disrupted because maybe some person doesn't have good attitude, maybe some person is you know like they're always bad mouthing, talking bad about other people, or they're talking bad about the team leader. Uh, they feel things are not being done, you know. So those kinds of things do happen, and then we have to address those matters, and that's where you know the, even among the volunteer teams, issues happen, problems have to be addressed. Okay. Uh, so we explain the policies and the guidelines. And training also is given, especially in the different teams. So usually, uh, two times a year, training happens. Everybody's called together. They said, hey, you know, this, this is how you do things. Or when we buy new equipment, new software, you know, the team has to be trained. So those things keep on happening. Or worship team training happens to improve their skills. Uh, and so on. Our children's church, CC ministers, once a year there is uh, training in June for all the church uh, CC ministers, all these things for different teams, training happens, and so on. Right? Um, yeah, and there's some notes here on training. And, you know. Okay. Um, So how do we maximize volunteer engagement? This is on the bottom of page 32. We'll do this and then go for a break. You know, um, what are the motivators? So for a volunteer, why would he want to volunteer in church? Right? What are the motivators? First of all, it's an opportunity to serve God. You know, so a volunteer should see this as, I am serving God. I'm doing something for God's kingdom. You know. I am uh, you know, doing something for the ministry. Secondly, uh, they, they, they feel connected to the vision, mission, and work. They say, yeah, I, I believe this in vision. You know, um, I, I believe in what's happening at APC. I believe in what's happening through this church or through this. Song. So then they want to be a part of it. You know, they want to contribute through that, to the uh, vision of, of the organization. Uh, 
for some, it's also an opportunity for them to learn something and grow. You know, like, for example, they come to church, maybe somebody doesn't know how to, you know, let's say work with cameras or the media. So they learn it in church, then it helps them in their professional life, actually. Right? So then they take the skill back and they can do better in their professional life. So for some people, that is also a motivation. Hey, I can learn this here in church and I, take, I can take it back to my workplace or for my profession and it helps them. Um, for some people, uh, they have the experience, expertise as leaders, decision makers. They would like to uh, bring that to the church. Uh, and there's also the potential for paid position. That means they know some for some, it's like hey, if I volunteer here, maybe eventually I can work for the church. So that's also motivation. So there are different you know, different things that uh, uh, motivate people uh, to serve as volunteers. And um, yeah, so some of the things that we have to be careful is we don't overwork or burn out our volunteers. You know. So example, like we're making changes. So, you know, from 2023, 2024, uh, recently we did this. Actually, um, uh, we had a staff meeting, I think, maybe, I'm thinking two months ago, we had a staff meeting. We were, we were discussing, you know, how was everything going? And one of the feedback was there are too many events happening. Even our staff were feeling very fatigued, too much work. Oh, then we said, okay, then I discussed it with the pastor. So along with the pastor, we had, made, we had a discussion. Then we did a survey. Uh, and then we realized that 2023, 2024, we had introduced a lot of new um, events happening. Uh, we introduced them for good reason, but the effect was uh, people, staff, um, volunteers, and even some congregation were feeling fatigued, they're feeling exhausted, feeling tired. Uh, because, you know, for many of these, the same volunteers have to serve, like worship team. Worship team have to serve every Sunday, plus they have to come and serve in these events and these conferences. So it's a lot of commitment now. Suddenly, uh, the demand on their time has increased because the number of events we are doing has increased. So more people have to come and lead worship. And so that was the feedback. And then Usually by September, we have the calendar ready for the next year. So our calendar was ready, but then when we got this feedback, then we said, okay, don't publish the calendar yet. Uh, this is the feedback that's coming based on 2023, 2024. So, you know, just this week, uh, I cut out so many events. Just said, we're not going to do that in 2025. Why? Because the feedback is people are feeling exhausted, you know. So we have to be thoughtful about, mindful about volunteers. We can't, uh, you know, just keep them driving them. Hey, you come, come, do, do, do this. They'll feel exhausted. You know? So, uh, so just this week, uh, we ch completely changed the calendar for 2025. We stopped a lot of the events that we were, were doing in 2023, 2024. We cut it out, and we said we will just do minimal events leave out all these other things because our volunteers, even our staff are feeling exhausted uh, with the amount of work that is there. So uh, this kind of feedback we get and we have to make changes. And so hopefully 2025 will bring us into a good balance that, okay, this is what we are able to do, uh, where everybody is able to work, staff and volunteers and the congregation are able to participate without feeling exhausted, without feeling tired, you know? So this, we will see, 2020 will be a good balance where there's not too much events, but just the right thing uh, for people to participate. Okay? So uh, let me pause here and uh, take any questions before we go for break, and then we'll continue this after break. Any questions? Yeah, Prince. So, Pastor, like, uh, we were talking about volunt volunteers, right? So... If it is in church, like we mentioned, like uh, there is some expectations we have from volunteers. Yes, yes. So if it is a church setting, church uh, ministry. Yes. So okay, like we know, like we will also expect the same standards mm -hmm. that 
how they behave outside also matters to us mm, and mm. they're volunteering but what about if the uh ministries like christian ministries which do social work mm, mm, mm. so their volunteers we can't is it okay to invite uh volunteers from other faith to come and be part of volunteering and also when they go outside their lifestyle can be very different mm, it, mm. it may not align to biblical standards mm. so is that okay to allow them when we are doing a social work ministries mm. especially under the name of like christian yeah. organization mm. good question and i think it really depends on the leadership what they would like to do so in general there is nothing wrong for example if you're distributing food to the hungry anybody can distribute that food right doesn't you don't doesn't have to be a christian to give that food packet right anybody hindu muslim can stand there and give the food packet to the hungry person right uh, or whatever that social work is anyone can do it so in some situations the leadership may decide look we will welcome even non christians to come and work with us so that in the process we can impact them influence their lives with the gospel so that could be one posture and it's a good thing it's a right thing nothing wrong with that or the leadership may take another uh stance where they say no we want everybody to be believers so that when we give the food we may be able to pray with the people and minister to the people in the name of jesus and that is also a good thing right so i think it just really depends on the leadership of that organization how they want to function i'm not saying there there, there are the, both sides there are positives and it just depends on how they want to function you know uh what direction they would like to go uh the advantage of the first one is you will get more volunteers you hindus muslims they will come because you know we're just distributing food or uh we are giving some clothes or we're cooking uh, whatever whatever that social work is anybody can do it and we get to the other advantage is we get to influence other people with the gospel uh the second option where you where the leader may say i want only one believers okay the advantage is you can have everybody of the same mind you can pray with the people and you know you can uh, do that part which may not be so easy when you have okay. the disadvantage with that is uh if if um if you're a, a, a an ngo and you want uh, and you want uh, contributions say from corporates to fund your projects if you tell them or if they find out that you only em engage people of a certain religious belief they won't give because they want it to be secular you're just doing you know you're doing social work so it's it shouldn't be aligned to any religion it should be secular anybody can come and do it so then they would not contribute so those things you have to be careful about and uh, what is the main objective i think that the leadership and you will find both kinds of organizations functioning yeah any questions okay let's go for our 10 minute break we'll come back and continue talking about volunteers thank you Thank <laughs> you.